everybody. Good morning. So I'm Laura Izarra. I am Associate Director of, uh, for National Cooperation at USP International Cooperation Office. And I will coordinate the activities this morning. Uh, I would like to express our satisfaction for receiving DFG's workshop for Germany and the Academic Excellence Initiative. So I would like to call Professor Vahan Agopian, Acting President of USPI, to say a few words. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, on behalf of our President, Professor Marco Antonio Zago, I would like to welcome all of you in this meeting. Uh, and first of all, to thank you very much to having this meeting at USP. It's a, it's a very, it's our privilege, it's our honor to have you here to discuss this very important topic. I would like to, uh, to thank the support from the German consulate and the vice consul is here with us. His support is very, was very important. DFG which really also, also supporting and sending representatives to share their expertise in this subject. And thank you very much for you, attendee, attendees, that uh, the number of and the importance of attendees show the, how this subject is very much, uh, very much considered in our country. And I, I hope that this workshop helps us to, let's say, to make it stronger, our ideas, and to fulfill, to have a similar initiative in Brazil. Thank you very much. Professor Raul Machado, President of USP International Cooperation Office, will address to you on behalf of our country. Thank you, Professor Laura. It is a great uh, pleasure to welcome you to the workshop that we will discuss the excellence of initiative, the excellence initiative of the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research and the German Research Foundation. Since Catherine Winkler came to Sao Paulo, arrived to Sao Paulo, we from Alcani, we from uh, Graduate Provost Office and from Research Provost Office, we look forward for this opportunity and to establish a fruitful relationship with German Research Foundation, the FED. We already have a significant partnership with German universities. We collaborate with uh, 53 universities under 86 agreements. And between 2010 and 2016, we have published jointly 3,521 papers, among which 2,176 with the top-ranked universities in Germany, according to QS. And this is a great opportunity for the University of Sao Paulo to strengthen international cooperation of research with German universities. Now a little short story about USP and German connection. Last June, I was invited by Humboldt University to s for the celebration of 250th anniversary of Hilheim from Humboldt. And on that occasion, I told, I told them the following. At the beginning of the 20th century in Berlin, at Kaiser Wilhelm Institute für Biologie, Zoo Berlin, Professor Karl Kochens, a rediscoverer of Mendel, had a great talent assistant called Frederick Gustav Brigge, that in 1936 had to leave Germany. And in England, he met Professor Melo Moraes, Dean of USP Agriculture College, that hired him to establish the areas of plant cytology and genetics at USP. He was not only important for the consolidation of genetics in Brazil, but he was also decisive to establish the full-time professorship for the entire University of Sao Paulo. Full-time professorship, which means association of teaching and research, which means also 
the practice of homeboat ideas. This short story put together, Germany, Uspi, Mendel, and Humboldt. We consider this workshop an opportunity to know new ways to promote cutting edge research, to strengthen our international collaboration through clusters of excellence. Thank you for the presence of all. Thank you. Now I will call Professor Eduardo Krieger, um, Provost of Research at USPI. Good morning. It's a real honor and a pleasure to have this meeting at USPI. Uh, I think this is a very symbolic meeting, workshop. Uh, there are global challenges that involve how to sustain university, universities in general, and in particular, which uh, is of great importance for University of Sao Paulo, is how to sustain a research university. I think this is a challenge for everyone involved in this field. We're gonna have to be very creative in the future. Uh, we have unique opportunities here in Brazil. We are blessed with the possibility of having uh, uh, defined income from the state, and we have to take uh, advantage of that. Few universities in the world have this, uh, 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 this advantage that we hold at the University of Sao Paulo, together with the co-sister uh, universities uh, in the public system in the state. Unicamp and UNESP are the other two. The, the, the challenge here and that we would like to learn with you from uh, Germany is how to make choices, how to prioritize things, and how to convince the public, our colleagues, and the, the, the uh, people in the executive and legislative office that are the one uh, distributing the money, how to do that in a non-homogeneous way, take it into account uh, 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 excellence, and how the universe have to adapt to that. So it's a really, all stakeholders have to do their homework, and we don't want to reinvent the wheel. So this is a great opportunity for us to exchange information that I think some of them will be directly applied to the challenges that we have for the next four years while we have here uh, the future uh, pro, uh, president of the university that now uh, in this uh, still holds the vice presidents. So I thank you all and I hope we're gonna have a very enjoyable and profitable exchange of ideas. Thank you. And I would like to call now Mr. Jens August, a German vice consul, please. Dear Professor Vahan Agopian, Professor Raul Machado, Professor Krieger, dear Katrin Winkler, dear guests from Germany, Dr. Werberger and Dr. Oliver Wigner. Good morning and uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here this morning and uh, to say a few words at the opening of today's workshop and on Germany and the Academic Excellence Initiative. First of all, I would like to say that the partnership between Germany and the University of Sao Paulo is something for which we are very grateful and very proud of. With its numerous strategic partnerships with German universities and research organizations, the alliance between Germany and USPI is diversifying and deepening every year. This serves, in our view, the internationalization of both our country's scientific landscape as well as the development of good and strong networks in order to work together on today's most challenging problems. Regarding FAPESPI, we are equally happy about the sharp partnership between DFG and FAPESPI. 
Last year, we celebrated the 10th anniversary of this cooperation, which has been very successful, and I'm sure the DFG and FAPESPI, as two houses of excellence, will continue to inspire each other also in future. Looking at the great number of common research projects, scientific cooperation has clearly become a centerpiece of German-Brazilian relations. The biggest number of agreements between Brazil and Germany during the first intergovernmental negotiations in Brasilia in 2015 was reached in the area of research and innovation. In our view, these agreements have been a case in point for a more general pattern of the foreign policy of Germany and, as I see it, also of Brazil. We are both more than ever dedicated to international cooperation and to productive partnerships. And we both want to foster the result-oriented cooperation between science and research on the one side and our economies, our companies on the other. In that context, uh, Germany welcomes all positive signs of an economic recovery of Brazil and the reform efforts of Brazil to overcome the economic crisis of the last few years. To us, it seems clear that the improvement of the economic situation will also further increase the possibilities of Brazilian science and research institutions for international cooperation and exchange in general, and for our bilateral cooperation more specifically. In conclusion, I want to say a brief word on the DFG. We are very happy that the DFG has developed a strong footprint in Brazil and has been cooperating very successfully with Brazilian science and research institutions, as well as funding agencies, in particular with CAPES. As I was told, as a result of that cooperation, for example, more than 230 bilateral German-Brazilian projects were funded by the DFG in the time from 2009 to 2017. In our view, that is brilliant and seems a very good basis for an even more intensive cooperation in future. In that spirit, I'm very glad that we have come together this morning to learn more about the state and possibilities of the German Excellence Initiative from DFG, as well as about the joint programs of DFG and FAPESPI, and uh, that we will also get first-hand information about the Brazilian Excellence Program and its role in the view of USPI and FAPESPI. Thank you very much for coming. I wish us all a very interesting workshop. Thank you. We will proceed now with the next panel. I would like to call um, in order to start our activities this morning, I will call the speakers of this first panel, Dr. Catherine Pinkhart, head of the DFG office in Latin America, uh, Dr. Klaus Verberger, vice director of the Department uh, for Coordinated Programs and Infrastructure, Dr. Oliver Wigner, a progr a program director and coordinator of the German Excellence Initiative at DFG, and Professor Carlos uh, Gilberto Carlotti, a provost of graduate studies at USP.
Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you very much for um, for inviting us to to give this event here, for inviting um, our guests to speak about the Alex Excellence Initiative, and uh, for giving me the chance here to present you um, a few of our joint programs between DFG and Capmed. Um, so before we come to the actual actual um, um, content of our event, I would like to give you the information, since we are in the state of Sao Paulo and since there are very many uh, good opportunities for joint collaborative activities between uh, German researchers and uh, researchers from the state of Sao Paulo. Um, before I uh, come to um, those joint programs, I would um, um, sh briefly introduce to you what the German Research Foundation is. The German Research Foundation in principle is a bit like the CAPES, but, uh, but responsible for um, funding um, research projects in anti-Germany. So we are Germany's largest funding organization for curiosity-driven research, and uh, we also call our ourselves a Germany's central self-governing research funding organization. And that has um, quite some implications. Although we receive public money, so money from the um, federal and uh, state governments of Germany, we are somewhat independent in our and, uh, and in our boards um, are um, um, s um, uh, located scientists of German scientists, um, which have um, the ma majority um, of votes in principle to determine. Um, the policy of German research funding, and also to decide on, on to decide on on funding um, um, programs and projects. Um, we are organized in principle to make it simple as a club, and as every club, we are having um, members, and our members are German universities and research institutions. Um, we have administrative autonomy. And we work according to the bottom-up principle, and that means that we, that we are uh, serving all branches of science and humanities. And so with an annual budget of about 3 billion euros, um, uh, we are funding about 30,000 projects every year. Um, although th the German Research Foundation is a national funding organization, um, the international collaboration between Germany and um, 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 foreign countries is a is a, a very important component of German Research Foundation. Why is that? Because I think this is quite obvious in, in, in these days, because research transcends national boundaries, and also certain topics are being best researched within the framework of an international collaboration. I think climate change, question of climate, tra climate change, energy, but uh, all other um, 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 scientific questions are good examples for um, for working in an international collaboration. Um, how we are, are we doing this? Um, the DFG has a variety of agreements between all kinds of countries um, in the world. And also we have some offices worldwide, one of which is um, the office here in Sao Paulo, being responsible for international cooperation between um, uh, Germany and Latin American countries. So we are not only responsible for Brazil, but also for or Latin America. Um, very briefly, what we do here, and this is also to invite you to contact us if you have questions, we are serving as a contact point for you who are interested in a collaboration with a German um, scientist or if you are interested to go to Germany um, to, s to spend a research stay there. Uh, so we provide you with information about um, the German research lands landscape, about um, uh, opportunities for funding. Um, and another aspect, of course, is also to maintain our uh, good uh, partnerships with um, um, partner organizations here in Brazil, such as FAPESP, such as CAPES, um, and other um, um, state and federal funding organizations of Brazil. In that way, we are very strongly focusing on de developing joint funding instruments in order to enable you to work with um, German um, researchers. Um, this is only an overview about our agreements we have in Brazil at the moment. So our longest agreement is together with CAPES since 1995. Um, since 2007, we have an agreement with Simpique. Um, a very good functioning agreement is with, together with FAPESP um, since 2006, which was renewed in 2011 and 
um, 16 last year. Also, we have a long-standing relationship with Papimik since 2009, and in, 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 in 2014, we opened, uh, we signed an agreement together with Papesh, Papesh uh, from the state of Rio de Janeiro, and um, opened a first call together with them. Um, at DF3, we have a variety of about 35 different programs, I think. Um, and what is important um, for German or for researchers in Germany who are eligible at DFG is that in principle in all our programs um, they can, in, can apply for funding and uh, international collaboration. Um, so we have, uh, have modified our programs in a, day, in a way that we have now a module for international collaboration and which can be uh, in which you can apply for funding research stays, visits or workshops and so on. But we are using uh, a few programs more often, and I would like to briefly introduce to, to you those programs. This is, for instance, uh, the program Initiation of an International Collaboration, um, which serves as a first, um, first um, um, contact possibility for discussing ideas f and for figuring out maybe a joint research project. project. Once you have done this, um, you may apply for a bilateral collaborative project to really work together, to do research together, which provide you with funding of about three years, funding at the German side, personnel, consumables, everything what you would need actually for the project. And, um, and you here as a, as a, person, as a, as a researcher as in, in the state of Sao Paulo, you ha would have to apply or would receive um, funding provided by PAPES, for, for, for example. If you have a broader scientific topic, an interdisciplinary topic, and a, and a variety of um, researchers you, you would like to um, incorporate in order to um, 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 work with them towards um, this research topic, you may think of applying within our joint programs, um, joint coordinated programs or collaborative programs that um, um, involve um, various scientists between five and 15 scientists, more or less. Then you may apply for, for instance, for an international research training group, um, which combines research and internationalization and also training of PhD students. You may think about applying within a research unit, a bilateral research unit, which um, does not imply a training component, but is a principal uh, um, collaborative um, research um, program with which goes beyond an individual research project. Or you may even apply in a so-called co collaborative research center that is an uh, uh, even bigger research consortium of about 15 to 25 PIs, to give a rough number. Those programs run for a, for a time period between um, six and 12 years. And um, what is most important here is that um, since, as I said beforehand, um, DFG is a national funding organization, um, we work on the principle of matching funds. That means we need a partner organization that provides funds for the Brazilian side. And since we are in the state of Sao Paulo and have a very good agreement with FAPESP, um, you may apply with in all those programs I was, I was um, introducing to you for funding um, um, your research here in the state of Sao Paulo together with the German researchers. Um, very quickly, um, to our cooperation with FAPESP, um, we provide funding for the initiation um, of a bilateral collaboration, so you may apply for funding for mobility, to visit somebody in Germany, um, to invite somebody to come over here um, to Sao Paulo, you may apply for funding for a bilateral workshop. And at DFG, we have this program which is called Initiation of International Collaboration, which has a duration of one year and provides funds for up to three months within one year for all those items I, I just, just mentioned. And in FAPESP, you have a variety of international programs you probably will know, which you find also on their website in which you would have to apply and combine um, the pro proposal together with the German applicant. Mm. Um, as I said, once you have figured out a new uh, an, uh, joint program, you may think about a joint research project and um, you are very happy that you are in the state of Sao Paulo because FAPES is the only organization we allow for 
um, for the continuous submission of a joint research project between uh, uh, Brazilian and uh, German researchers. So in the last year, we, we modified this joint program in a way that now you have the possibility to apply for a joint research pro uh, project for, for duration up to three years, which may be renewable, even renewable, even on, on, the, on the Brazilian side here. You would, um, in, in parallel, submit the joint research proposal, and the joint research proposal would have to have one joint research kernel, so that it should be identical uh, with regard to the scientific part of the, of the proposal. And as I said, there are no submission deadlines, so we have no calls together with FAPES, but in standing open calls, so to say. So you may apply at any time um, a joint research project to FAPES and at the same time to DFG. Um, at DFG, the program is called Research Grant. At FAPES, the program is called Auxilia Pesquisa Regular. I think everybody will be very, very, um, uh, will know very, very much about this um, program at FAPES. Um, in this program, we have uh, still separate peer review procedures according to our rules at, at, at our both organizations, but we have a joint decision. That means only if both organizations um, would like to fund the projects, we will jointly fund the proje project. If one organization says uh, we don't want to fund it, then um, uh, unfortunately the project won't be funded at all. Now, um, if you have a, a, a broader topic you would do, do research on, and if you know a group of researchers here in Sao Paulo you are working already with, and also a group of researchers in Germany, you may consider a, a collaborative research project. And um, those, as I said before, those joint programs offer a budget for a longer period of time, so between six and 12 years. Um, and we have developed last year um, not only the opportunity to submit a joint research, collaborative research project, but also a joint evaluation procedure together with FAPESP. So what you would do, you would figure out your research proposal, you would write down a joint research proposal again, um, according to specific, um, um, the specific programs at DFG and at FAPESP. And you would submit par in parallel uh, submit um, the research, uh, the joint research projects to FAPESP and DFG. Again, it would be the same scientific project um, kernel, and again, there are no submission deadlines. But what is important here is that we are following a two-stage um, um, pro uh, submission procedure. Um, and uh, at FAPESP, you would submit your proposal uh, according to the program Auxilia Pesquisa Progetto Tematico. And at DFG, the Germans would have to look at our program portfolio and would consider either the program International Research Training Group, which has a duration of nine years, or Research Unit, which has a duration of six years, or even a collaborative research center, which would have a duration of up to 12 years. Um, um, you would, um, at, at the German side, we would uh, receive a concept in the first phase, and here at FAPESP, you would simply contact FAPESP for submitting um, a, a, a short abstract in order to figure out whether or not you are eligible at FAPESP. Um, we figured out an, a, a joint evaluation procedure that means we would do um, an, an evaluation as we are doing it at, in, in Germany at DFG. And that means we don't have written peer review reviewing procedure, but we allow for a panel meeting in which the researchers jointly present their research projects and are being evaluated, evaluated by a group of researchers um, at the site in Germany or in Brazil. Um, all projects, you won't receive funding for the entire time of, 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 the, of the program, but um, they are um, separated in different evaluation rounds. That means, for, for instance, for an international research training group, you would um, have a first funding period of four and a half years, for a research unit of three years, and for a collaborative research center of uh, four years each phase. Again, here important is we only fund the projects if um, both sides would like to fund um, the program, but since we are doing a joint evaluation, there's a high probability that if we 
decide on funding that also the other side will fund, of course. Um, as an example, you already have an international research training group. Very briefly, um, we have this in physics. Um, uh, it's called dynamical phenomena in complex networks. Um, the objective, very briefly again, is structured training of PhD students under excellent research conditions with supervision and interna international exchange. Um, that means we have a group of researchers working towards a topic. We have uh, 10 to 15 PhD students on each side working together. We have sub interlinked uh, sub-projects in in, inside this um, program. Um, and which allow um, an international exchange of PhD students. That means every PhD student would have to spend six to 12 months in the other country, which would be part of the um, PhD th thesis of the individual um, um, PhD student. At the German side, we allow a, a budget of about 1.5 to 3 million euros, roughly for a funding period of four and a half years. And, um, um, yeah, to the submission procedure, I think I, I, I said, said a few words. If you have detailed questions, please contact us um, after the event, then I could you give, give you some, some more explanation how to proceed. Now, very briefly, a few numbers. We observed that the um, joint publications between um, Germany and Brazil are increasing or have increased in the last year since 1999, as you can see. And we observe that apart from physics and astronomy and astrophysics, which are classically very strong um, fields um, and, and publica joint publication, we see a strong, for a strong um, um, areas in chemistry, material science, environmental sciences, neuroscience and neurology, and uh, biochemistry, molecular biology. If you have a look at our funding statistics, and he here you see the our DFG funding statistics between 2009 and 17, um, uh, you see that in this uh, time period of about eight years, we have been funding 233 projects or even more with a budget of at least 43 um, million euros. Um, these um, um, incorporate all research projects being either unilateral funded or bilateral bilaterally funded together with the Brazilian um, funding organization. And you see here that we have a strong focus in engineering sciences, about 30% of projects um, being funded are in engineering sciences. This is because we have a very strong um, initiative together with, with CAPES in um, manufacturing engineering. Um, we have a strong fo focus, of course, in, in physics sin since we have these uh, international research training group together with FAPESP and also classically geoscience is very strong and also chemistry. But I think in, in general we have a good distribution about the, the areas of research um, and maybe a few numbers from the state of Sao Paulo. 70 out of 233 projects are within the state of Sao Paulo or with including researchers of the state of Sao Paulo and even 40 of 233 projects are together with scientists at the USP. And I think this is quite a good result for USP as well. Um, uh, now, uh, what you see here on the right-hand side of this slide, you see that, um, that uh, about 50% of projects and 50% of mobility projects are being co-funded already with the Brazilian partner organization. I think this is a very good sign for our collaboration um, and our activities here. But still, and I think we are on a good way together with our strong partner organizations here in, in Brazil, um, this uh, can still be increased. And this is in principle what I wanted to introduce to you. We are, of course, we have a, have a lot of um, uh, further ideas how to, how to improve um, the opportunities for researchers and here in the state of Sao Paulo, for instance, we would like to uh, create a, a, a small program for, for, do, uh, for young researchers in order to support the internationalization for young researchers. And um, we are strongly focusing on promoting our joint activities, um, which is very important since we don't have calls, we don't launch calls. Um, I have the feeling that sometimes um, researchers are not aware of their opportunities. 
And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And as I said, if you have um, further questions, please feel free to contact us here in our office, which is in Sao Paulo, Gran Vesolieta. We are always um, um, are happy to answer you any questions you have. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, let me thank you, the president-elect, um, for inviting us um, to Sao Paulo, to this um, wonderful university. And thank you to the audience for your interest in uh, this workshop. Um, my name is Klaus Werberger, and um, at the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft, together with Oliver Wigner, um, we are part of the team organizing the German Excellence Initiative. And um, my presentation will um, have two parts, and then Oliver Wigner will add um, some more details on operational aspects. The first part will be about the past, about the experience in Germany with the Excellence Initiative, um, which started in 2006 and um, is ending more or less this year. Um, and then the second part will focus on the so-called excellence strategy, which is a kind of continuation um, of the excellence initiative starting next year. And right now we are in the middle of um, preparing for this next phase. What was the idea behind the excellence initiative? Early in this century, um, there was a consensus in the European Union to raise the level of funding for research and education. And uh, as part of that um, joint effort, German government decided, um, yes, we also need to increase our spending. And um, part of that um, increase um, was um, the excellence initiative. The first idea presented by the government was um, to just select maybe two or three German universities and to give them a lot of money. So to make them uh, into a German Harvard or MIT or Oxford, or uh, whatever your favorite uh, universities may be. Um, when this was discussed with the German Research Foundation, um, we said, well, maybe that's not the best way to spend the money because uh, excellence in research in Germany is distributed a bit more widely. Some universities are very good in one area, others are very good in another area. And also we do need more reforms at uh, the graduation level. So the excellence initiative then developed in three funding lines. The overall aim was to strengthen Germany as a research location to make Germany's research more competitive, um, to make Germany more attractive for researchers also from outside of Germany. To do this in the segment of top level research, there are different uh, um, functions, of course, in the research system and the function of the excellence initiative was focused on top research. At the same time, um, it was clear that not uh, all the universities are the same, and um, a specific aim of the Excellence in Initiative was uh, to increase the differentiation in the German research system. And that's not um, necessarily a differentiation into strong and weak or good and bad. It's a differentiation in maybe top-level research, maybe top-level education, maybe top-level academic um, basic uh, curiosity-driven research and maybe top-level applied research. Here the focus is on top-level basic research. And then, of course, it was recognized that in order to do this, you do need cooperation 
networks within the university. You need networks with partners from industry, but also other partners like museums and whatever is appropriate for the topic of research. And to do this, as I mentioned, um, you need to increase the level of funding and we have been fortunate to really receive fresh money for new ideas. The three funding lines I mentioned are first of all the graduate schools. In Germany, um, the starting point was that in many cases there is an individual relationship between a doctoral student and his supervisor, doctorant and doctor vater. Um, and um, the duration of a PhD program was very individual. The level of supervision was very individual. And um, the graduate schools um, had their aim to promote early career researchers um, such that they can reach scientific independence at an earlier stage, but also that um, they can have some structured training within their graduation phase. Um, typically, um, an award in, in this funding line was between one and two and a half million per year. The second funding line, and uh, in terms of the um, amount of funding used with 300 million per year in total, was the clusters of excellence. Clusters are really centers. They are located essentially at one university. All the funding goes to this one university. Then it can distribute part of that to partners um, within the cluster. And the typical cluster has between 100 and 300 scientists at all levels of expertise working there. Um, of course, also technicians and whatever may be needed, but graduate students, postdocs, junior research groups, and full professors working together in, uh, under a common topic. Um, and we had uh, on, and still have uh, 43 of these clusters of excellence running. And then um, any university which had at least one graduate school and at least one such cluster of excellence was eligible for the so-called institutional strategy, which uh, sometimes is simply just called excellence university. And as you will learn later, it's now really called universities of excellence uh, funding line. So 11 universities have been selected to receive this additional funding of 10 to 13 million euro per year, which is not really that much considering the total budget of the university, which can go into several hundred million euros. But it also has a very high symbolic value. And there is additional money which the rectorate can use to really strengthen the governance in the university to really strengthen the management in the university and to give it to particular areas of research which fit well into the strategic plan of the university. And this um, funding line uh, is being administrated um, by the Wissenschaftsrat, the uh, German Council of Science and Humanities. The other two funding lines are administrated by the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft and we work together in this type of program. For all three funding lines, um, there were very little, um, there was very little specification. Um, it was um, an opportunity for the universities to develop their own strategies. It was a challenge for the universities to analyze their strengths and weaknesses and then come up with a plan based on their specific situation um, and um, including um, the development of the university as a whole. Um, and at the same time, it was a free competition with no quota, for example, for some regions like North or South or East and or West, um, no quota for disciplines, but all the proposals were just put on the table and then um, there was no discussion about how much do we want to give to biology and how much do we want to give to uh, linguistics. Um, but there was only a discussion about how good is this proposal and how good is that proposal. 
the, the criteria for this um, competition have been published well in advance, such that uh, everybody knew what they are getting into. And uh, essentially, the, the criteria was the quality of the research plan presented, the originality, um, the quality of the researchers themselves, then the quality of the structures and strategies, for example, strategies how they want to hire new faculty um, with the funding from the program, how, want to, how they want to advertise their postdoc and graduate student positions, how they want to manage the program, and then the research environment, which includes how do they cooperate with partners in the region and with partners worldwide. Now, what did we find? What were the outcomes um, of this 10 years of funding? Well, first of all, of course, it was exciting new research, um, many top-level papers. Um, but on a structural level, it was stronger interdisciplinary cooperation, because that was also our criterion to really uh, to put together different um, disciplines and to make that fruitful. And then with a five-year funding period um, and such a large amount of funding, there were large opportunities for innovation. You could try experiments. Not every experiment has to be successful, but some of them are, and, and then you build on that. We encourage new ways of cooperation between universities and other research institutions like, you know, Max Planck, Helmholtz, Fraunhofer, Leibniz Institutes. Um, recruitment um, in Germany was um, not, as a matter of course, international, but now in, as, it, it is more international, and certainly within this initiative, the recruitment was very international. Uh, some almost 6,000 new positions have been created with this initiative, and uh, among them, 360 full professors hired um, with funding from this initiative, and roughly half of them came from outside of Germany. And that's excellent considering that on the average less than 10% of professors in Germany are hired from abroad. And similarly, for example, for the junior research group leaders, uh, one third of them uh, were attracted from outside of Germany. Um, it certainly helped that um, within this initiative, new models of career development um, were um, practiced. Tenure track which was not a common concept in Germany before the initiative, and it is a very common concept now. Mentoring was not a matter of course before the initiative, and mentoring at all levels, from the graduate student level to through the postdocs and junior professors um, is now much more widespread. Uh, Team-oriented supervision, gender equality is a problem in the German research system. We have only 20% women professors, and um, one aim of the initiative was also to promote this. This aim has been, with this aim we have been pass, partially successful. It needs a lot of um, more effort and long-term development to uh, achieve even more in that respect. Uh, functional differentiation, yes, um, has been achieved. Uh, there is now a kind of map of Germany with the excellence projects, and these are very visible, and there are research universities and uh, other universities um, focusing on different um, aims. Certainly, there now is much more strategic planning in the universities in Germany. The rector, the president of a university, is not just um, administrating the university, but is really um, pushing the university forward, is together with um, his and her colleagues developing strategies for the university uh, based on a critical analysis on strengths and weaknesses. And yes, we did find increased international visibility. Of course, uh, with, a, with projects of this size, um, we also um, found challenges and problems. For example, if you have such a cluster of excellence, um, 
then it can be difficult to um, build this into the structure of the university. Um, if you have funding for five years, it can be difficult if it then it's discontinued. Um, what will remain after the end of funding? Um, if you get uh, funding for five or for ten years, um, then you have to be very careful with fixed term recruitments and with permanent recruitments. <clears throat> if you focus so much on top level research, you have to be careful not to neglect teaching. So for example, the, the, the newly hired professors should all also um, contribute to teaching. They should be visible to the students such that they also uh, have a benefit from um, this <coughs> initiative. Then of course it can be unfair to judge the quality of a university based only on uh, the criterion whether they are in or not in um, this uh, or that funding line. Of course, we also knew that changes in the legal framework need time and um, also the changes required, for example, to establish tenure track in the German um, research system takes time and is still um, going on. As I mentioned, increasing the number of female researchers is a long-term project. And then, um, of course, when our government asked us, um, after almost 10 years of funding now, what um, have been the outcomes, uh, as I just uh, in the previous slide showed you, uh, some of them, um, it uh, was a challenge for us to measure the success of such initiative. There's always a temptation to just count publications or anything but uh, anything quantitative, and we did some of that, but, um, <clears throat> thank you, we did some of that, but uh, the most important um, evaluation uh, of the success of the initiative was maybe the midterm evaluation which took place in 2012, where all the projects funded in the first phase of the initiative competed with um, very many excellent new projects trying to get into the program. And we found with the international peer review that um, roughly 85% of the ongoing projects were rated um, as very successful and were then continued and 15% dropped out. But um, the peer review showed that uh, the most of the investment was really um, well placed. Now, <clears throat> the excellent strategy is the next phase. Um, it starts in 2018 and it builds on the dynamics generated by the excellence initiatives um, in the, the first two phases. Um, it does maintain the level of funding, which is very important, and it comes with the same philosophy of free painting and free competition. Um, one lesson we learned is that um, five years is a good funding period, but it's really not quite long enough for projects of that size to be fruitful and to show their results. So we are happy to now have seven years of funding period, and only after seven years um, there will be the next round uh, of competition. And the program as such is no longer an initiative, which means fixed term, but it is a strategy and it, in principle, it's unlimited. Each individual project, of course, has a finite lifetime and has to apply for an extension um, if they want to, but the program as such is not limited anymore. We have learned that it's um, a challenge for the university to really uh, adopt to such um, a strategy, so now there is not only an, an overhead component of the funding, but there also is a new university allowance, and both elements go directly to the university, um, but still, of course, the main part of the funding goes to the team of researchers um, doing the research. Um, we had three funding lines previously, now it's focused um, on two funding lines, the graduate schools have been very successful. They've been so successful 
that they don't need additional support by DFG anymore, but um, the concept of a graduate school is now, other than 15 years ago, is now quite widespread and the universities can do this on their own. Um, the second funding line, University of Excellence, again, um, 11 of them will be selected in 2018. And um, some of those funded now may be successful and um, continue to be universities of excellence. Others will drop out and uh, new universities may um, achieve that level of excellence. And in the previous excellence uh, initiative, the condition was to have at least one graduate school and one cluster. Now the condition is to have at least two clusters which is really tough and not too many universities um, will be able to achieve that. Well, we hope, of course, to strengthen the research landscape in Germany, Germany such that in 2030 we will look back and um, find um, a very strong internationally competitive landscape. And I just want to highlight the last point on this slide. It's very important, um, and one of the previous speakers also mentioned that, to be well appreciated by society. After all, the funding for the university system comes from the taxpayer. Um, after all, all the, the students going to universities reflect the society, and it's important to embed all these um, projects and to embed the universities in the society, and that's also why we, why we require all of these projects to be very active in public outreach in science communication. Well, thank you very much. Um, and if you have questions, we can either, um, you can have the opportunity now or maybe later after my colleague uh, Oliver Wigner has given his presentation. Thank you. So good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure for me to give you this short talk about operational aspects of the Excellence Initiative. And I try to, well, can lead you through this in this 20 minutes talk, doing that in two parts. So talking about the perspective of a funding agency looking at the Excellence Initiative. And also I would like to invite you to have a look at the perspective of a university being funded and being suffering from the Excellence Initiative somehow. To start, so I would like to familiarize you with our decision-making process. And what I would like to point out with this um, presentation here is that we usually we have three steps of making decisions. And this includes, first of all, of course, the scientific review. So the proposals, the draft proposals or the full proposals were handed over to specialists evaluating that. But these specialists are not the people who make the final decision, but they just evaluate that. And then we pass that to a committee or to a commission which compares or to assess these referee, these ref reviews which are there. But also this group does not finally do the decision, but just compares and makes probably a recommendation of funding, but the final decision is done by a third body. And we use this scheme for all our DFG funding schemes, and especially this was also used um, with special features within the Excellence Initiative. And this is important that this is a multi-step process, including, as you see here, drafts and full proposal phase, so two times three steps, in order to make it very transparent, make it, it very fair, and make it as obvious as possible. And what we try as well is to give feedback to the applicants at more or less each of these steps so they knew why they have been successful, they knew where they should improve in order to be successful with a full proposal after submitting a, perhaps a positive draft, and also they understand why they have not been successful in order to improve for the next round, in order to learn how to change the management and their research idea to understand what the criteria and the, what the criticism was. 
So this, I think, is one of the really important things. So looking at the Excellence Initiative, you see the right scheme there. This is fairly complicated, and I don't want to lead you through that. But what you again see, might see here, we have two phases, the draft phases and a, a, a full proposal phase. And this is so complicated because we are dealing with three funding lines, so the graduate school, the clusters of excellence, and these institutional strategies. And as my colleague Klaus Werberger just mentioned, where the DFG is administrating these evaluation processes together with a partner organization, the German Wissenschaftsrat, VR, so this is the German Council of Science and Humanity. So it became quite complicated, but what is important, I already mentioned that, that we have a transparent and multi-step procedure and everybody knew what they're doing. So the referees know what they do, the members of the committees know what they do, and this was communicated to the entire academic community that so that they knew the conditions of the decision-making processes, they knew the criteria of the position, decisions, and they received feedback. What you see here is we had a success rate of 15%. So this is quite nice to say so. So we had a fair competition, so this most paperwork done by the applicants, of course, was in vain, but however, there was a fair chance to be successful. All over, we received about 830 proposals, which have been reviewed, and so roughly 115 were in the end successful, so this is a success rate of 15%, and this is even more competitive what we usually have within the DFG um, scheme. So this was a really tough competition for the university with high v visibility, and to make this possible, as you know, more or less, or as you might um, imagine, all German universities have, were involved in this process, bringing in proposals. And so we had to choose international experts to do the evaluation. So 85% um, of the experts doing the evaluation, the peer review came from abroad. And so um, we did that so to avoid conflicts of interest, but this has a second implication as well. We asked our referees to apply high international standards, the highest international standards. So we asked all the experts from all over the world to look very carefully whether this program and the proposals meet these international high standards. And what also happened in this pr process here was that they became somehow ambassadors for this program because they came back to their countries and had the opportunity to report on what is going on in Germany so they can explain this type of new competition and this type of momentum being um, somehow put to the German science system so they can talk at the universities what's going on in Germany and see what well, Germany is somehow involving and there are a lot of interesting research programs and there's a lot possibility for interaction. So this is a, at least two positive effects. So international standards, but also some type of, um, well, advertisement or, or um, publicity for the German program. What also is important, I come to that very briefly, is what we call an academically driven selection process. What means that all the decision-making bodies here were dominated by academic members. It's not political influence governing this process, no political arguments, but scientific arguments who govern to which lead the decision-making process. And to understand that better, um, you find here the more or less the um, the basic structure of our decision-making bodies. You see we have two groups of members within those bodies. On the right-hand side you see it's um, the members of the federal state and the, um, the states, of course. We are spending tax money, so this is the political part. But as we have in Germany 16 states and one federal government, so it's only 17 members coming from this political side. And the second group are the academics on the left side, and depending on the, well, on the period of the, this process, we had 29 or even 39, uh, 26 or even 39 members. So what is important here, that the academics, the scientists themselves, had the majority in the decision-making processes. So they were not influenced by regional or political or um, economical aspects, but the decision was 
more or less entirely dominated by the scientific arguments. And what you can see here in this yellow um, text is that the scientific members also had another a set of other very important duties. So they define the funding conditions. Of course, there's a legal framework for this whole competition set up by the politicians, but the definition and the, the formulation of the criteria was done by academics. So they formulate, they really set the criteria for the competition. They also select the drafts, which means the first selection step where more than 50% of the applications were cut out were done only by academics. So not a single politician was even in the room. So they, they really step back in order to leave this whole process making and this whole decision making process to the scientists and this, they gave a lot of credit into this project and um, this turned out to be very helpful for that. So um, that's what we call academic driven decision making process. Um, so talking about the criteria, this is also important. Of course, I don't want to talk about all these criteria, but what is important here is that it's, although it's a 12 or even 13 points, they are quite simple. We are talking about research, we are talking about the people, and we are talking about the structures. So this is the basic major set of criteria. And what we think the Excellence Initiative should do is it should foster excellent um, research at an international level. And this is what um, our criteria is um, designed for and this is also how our, all our templates are designed to make sure um, what we ask for. And of course we are asking for beneficial structures for the people doing this research. So these clusters or graduate schools at the university should provide an background, a structure which helps to do the best research, so free the people from burdens, providing excellent um, instrumentation, giving good management structures. And so these management structures are also an important aspect of this competition. We are not only dealing with good science, but also with a good um, environment in order to execute this type of science. So we would like to see that the clusters development, um, organizational structures, management and um, other um, elements in order to really support scientists with their work. When finally the decision has been done, what happened to the clusters? What happened to the graduate schools? I think what is important also here our scientists had the opportunity to develop to develop quite freely. So we uh, did not expect any interim reports. So they had the flexibility, flexibility and freedom and to just develop the way such they need. The only thing what we did is we had a lot of informal site visits where we traveled to the universities and we talked with the universities and the managers there about the success, about problems, about failures, about things to be changed, and of how to develop the whole system. And we try to exchange experiences. Um, and what we also organized were workshop and meetings where we invited the speakers of these large uh, research areas to, to come together and to exchange their knowledge and their experience with the local condition. So what we try to establish is something like a learning system where all the really excellent partners, although they are, are somehow competitors within the whole system, share their problems, share their success and discuss how to improve and how to develop the whole system. Of course, we gathered statistical data and did surveys, so we asked the universities to give us data about employment, in new, about recruitment strategies, about gender development, about um, a PhD thesis periods, how long they need in order to finish the work, about publication, all this type, and how about spending. But this also was, also everything was put together in order to um, formulate um, some reportings for the government. So in 2008 and 2015, we had um, full reports about the outcome of this initiative and reported to the government and provided something like an evaluation in order to, to, to convince 
um, the states and the federal government to continue this program. And also what is important in 2016, Prof. Dr. Werberger just mentioned, we had an international um, committee which systematically um, evaluated the success and the outcome of this program in order to make sure and to further develop this system. As we already discussed a bit, is it is very important that all, um, also non-scientists understand what is doing here. So we supported um, the, the clusters and the graduate schools with their public relation activities. So the DFG did something like advertisement and publicity for the program. We informed the public about the research done here so the people can really understand and be happy and feel that there's something important done. But, well, I think I should come to the second aspect. What does the Excellence Initiative mean for the universities, for the applicants? And first of all, I would like to talk about structures. As Klaus Werberger just pointed out, the whole idea of the program was the free painting. So the universities could start where they are and they should develop measures in order to to reach a next level of performance. And of course, as the universities are different, and as the federal states on the, the different states in Germany are different, all the, um, they started this very heterogeneous starting conditions at the universities. Um, so they had to overcome or they had to, 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 to deal with these um, heterogeneous conditions there uh, and to build up new things in order to really make it going. So for example, we had clusters of excellence which are not more than virtual, virtual working groups. So the professors being involved in this cluster or this graduate school are just sticking into their faculties and they just move on a regular, they just meet on a regular basis, but it's just more or less informal what they're doing. But we also had the situation at other universities where they really set up something like new institutes or new institutions with their own rights, with their own management, with their own um, budget responsibilities, with even the right to, to recruit professors. So there was a very d diversity of different types, how these clusters and how these schools were set up in order to answer to the specific needs at the universities. Um, and of course, we, as you probably know, we all are scientists, so we are educated in order to do research, but we are not necessarily educated to do management. And what happened here when these large-scale funding um, proposals came there and had to be run, they suddenly recognized that they need to have certain um, develop new traditions of, of communicating with each other and how to run such a cluster consisting of 10, 20 or even 150 individual PIs with their own um, needs and so they had to somehow um, calibrate between very strong leading um, mechanism, so dictatorship, or whether you would like to apply their democratic um, aspects in order to get this managed. And all this had to be developed in a very short time, so this um, causes a lot of um, thinking and communication in these clusters. And as Professor uh, Dr. Werberger just mentioned, 6,000 people had been hired and 360 professors came new to the universities. This is also a problem of infrastructure because the funds couldn't be used to build new buildings, so the university had to find space for all these new researchers in a very brief time and they had to provide the equipment which is necessary in order to do this type of research. And this leads me to the next um, part of my talk. It's about governance and communication, which we thought and which we learned is especially very important for the management of the universities. Um, the establishment, I just mentioned that, challenges the universities, but also challenges the leading scientists in these clusters. And so they had to develop new um, proceedings of interacting with each other. And this, of course, had um, the effect of what we call centrifugal forces because 
these new clusters, these new graduate schools were thought to be excellent and they want to speed up, they want to develop something, they want to do new things, but the rest of the university somehow has to go on as it always went on and they were taught not to be excellent and of course this causes tension and you have to communicate and make sure that the university the whole university develops and not only these parts of the university which are thought to be excellent and so the university had to change somehow also its management it mm, has to be make sure that there are parts in universities who are which are able to, to really support these innovative structures and the university um, and the administration of the university had to um, improve in that way that there it could not continue as usual but had to speed up and find new mechanism in order to support these newly ent uh, entities here. And what is also important is that as the whole um, competition made it necessary that the university really develop plans, strategic plans in order to, to develop themselves. So they really f have to find communication ways in order to really um, do this type of priority setting. And setting priorities always mean that you also set posteriorities and this of course is not easy for um, those universities, for all the universities in Germany in that time. And um, so you, you need new um, organizational units and you have to new management uh, aspects in these universities. So this leads me to the conclusion that it is important to, to communicate a lot in these universities and to give the opportunity to participate in these projects. And so lots of these graduate schools and clusters have been organized as large networks, like a spider, a spider in a network, so trying to interact with a lot of people. So it had not been a closed shop, but these clusters and these graduate schools mainly had been open to for the participation of other disciplines and this is very important that these um, elements were very interdisciplinary so you really can bring in scientists from all different disciplines in order to ask new questions in molecular medicine or in um, biology question or in, in engineering science and computer science. So you really, what we learned from this project that it was very successful in bringing people together from interdisciplinary and to bring them all there to let them participate and that leads to a new type of, partially at least, to, of identification with these units and with the whole university. So the people came proud of that. And of course, um, universities are somehow embedded in a legal framework and this legal framework is not always beneficial for universities as you probably all <laughs> suffer every day. So um, this competition being set up made it necessary that also the legal framework was changed and the university had good arguments to really say to the politician, we need new regulation in order to speed up, for example, our recruitment strategies. Some of the universities had mergers with non-university partners and also for that we need specific new rules for legislation and all this was made possible due to this process. And this one, what I, well, this is a complicated um, chart here, what I would like to draw your attention to are these blue, light blue and dark blue columns here. And what you see is these light blue things were done, things which um, were new activities of the university and the dark blues are, well, enhanced activities due to the funding. And we asked our speakers of the clusters and graduate schools with respect to um, research performance and internationalization, what they did, and well, they all enhanced their activity in international recruitment, in organization of international workshop, in financial support for conference participation at an international level, and they had new positions for early careers re researchers. So this fresh money fostered a lot of new activities at the universities which they so far did not do. So this was the major, well, 
element of innovation, that they really have free money to do things they always dreamed of. And they could hire fresh personnel and bring these um, things forward. Well, this will be my last slide, and what I would like to point out that we were fairly um, successful in um, attracting scientists from all over the world. And what you can see perhaps here is, um, for example, when you look at Brazil, that um, the majority, well, most looking at Latin America, the majority of scientists being attracted came from Brazil to the German excellence clusters. And we are very happy to have these data, and you can see the Excellence Initiative attracted scientists from all over the world and we hope to, to continue with this aspect in the next funding round but still this, um, there will be a lot of exchange um, enabled by this program and so I would like to thank you for your attention. I think our both talks are now open for discussion. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I would like to thank DFG for the opportunity to learn more about the German Academic Excellence Initiative. My special thanks to Catherine, Professor Klaus, and Professor Oliver to be in Brazil and to be in USP. As you know, I'm not from CAPES, and I don't speak on behalf of CAPES, so I will make a short presentation based on, on the visits of Professor Coney and Professor Abilio to USP, my participation in the task force in order to generate the CAPS call published last week regarding the internationalization of Brazilian universities, and also recent reports published in Brazilian newspapers. The motivation in order to create the program was due to the vision of CAPS International Office about the universities in Brazil. This slide is from Professor Coney, showing lacking international leadership, visibility, long-term strategy to change this situation, lack of commitment to the needs of the society, and few relations with private companies in Brazil. On the international scene, several countries, Europeans, Asians, and from Middle East, are carrying out programs designed to increase the quality of their universities. And these countries are already showing very nice results. Germany is perhaps the best example. Then, as you can see, France also, they have a program very similar to the to German program. CAPES planning involves four steps. The first one has already started, and the other three are expect, to, are expect for the next month. Concerning the first step, namely the print, it will be finalized on April 12, uh, 2018. At the time, the university must present a proposal for internationalization. And USP will have a plan, must have a plan to apply for this call until April. I have talked to Professor Vahan and probably we are going to create a task force to work with Alcani and Provost of our, uh, Graduate Studies and Research to, to have a good plan for USP to present for this call. Important points must be considered in this call. It foresees that 40 universities will be chosen. 
The focus will be on graduation, postdoctoral, and teachers' mobility, and research, research projects made with international universities. The budget for the first step is 300 million of reais per year, and the important point that must be emphasized is the participation of university in the definition of the destination of mobility, as well the prioritization of the different participants. For example, it's possible to focus the participation of graduate students or focus on participation uh, of uh, research, professor, or even balance this participation. The second step will be the creation of private fund with a forecast of two billion reais per year. I guess it's very similar to amount that Germany uh, puts in, in, the, in, in your program. Uh, the fund will be created by 1% of the profit that companies controlled by the federal agents have to expand by law in science and technology. So you can see in this square the formation of this fund based on the 1% of the profit of these companies. Usually companies uh, relate with telecommunication, uh, bioenergy, oil, gas. So it, it, it's expected that this profit can make this, this fund. Currently, these funds are poorly applied and often returns to the national treasury. Uh, Professor uh, Abilio told us yesterday that more than 50% of this money that should go to research and, and, and university goes to the federal treasury. So we are lacking this, this um, huge amount of money. Uh, step three and four are very similar to the German model already presented. The details of the Brazilian project are not yet known, but should include a cluster of laboratories and some university of excellence. We don't have the numbers, but the idea is the same that we have seen in, in Germany. Private funding will facilitate investment. This fund will be private. It's not a fund from CAPES or CNPQ. It's a private fund. So it will, the private fund will facilitate investment and will be applying mobility. Research projects also include hire staff. I see some problems that may arise in the implementation of this proposal by CAPS in Brazil. Uh, the, res the resistance of the academic community in accepting that some laboratories and universities will have a special funding. I guess Professor Krieger told me in the beginning, he, he thinks similar to, to me, and the tendency of the politicians to lobby for their electoral regions. I know in, in Germany you don't have this problem, but in Brazil the politicians are a, a huge problem for the, for the academia. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much to the speakers. You can keep your place there. And I would like to invite Professor Vahan Nagopian to present the perspective of our university, the University of Sao Paulo, on the Brazilian Excellence Program. Morning again. <laughs> I've got five minutes to, to, to present the perspectives of the University of São Paulo. Uh, first of all, I have to point out that I'm really uh, a strong supporter from this 
type of initiative. And I will do my best to make sure that we'll get something similar in Brazil. Uh, as you know, and uh, Raul Machat has just explained that the German university model is very important for us in Brazil. And the University of Sao Paulo was really designed based on German model, German approach. That, that is a very important point to start. Uh, and nowadays we are very sure the, about the quality and the relevance of the German university system. And I hope, that's why I hope that we manage to follow this new approach. The German Excellence Initiative uh, is a model that must be pursued in Brazil, and it's done by several countries in Europe, Asia, and uh, Pacific area. And I'm sure that this must be persuaded because it is really a model that makes the old system, the world system, more efficient. Uh, Carlotte has just uh, presented some difficulties we are finding in Brazil. Maybe because of mis misunderstanding what is uh, excellent initiative approach. Uh, we know that uh, this approach is very important for the system, but maybe some of our colleagues or some of our politi politicians, they believe that this initiative uh, gives privileges for a small number of universities or a small number of research groups, which is not correct. I, 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 I go through some of your results, and it's very clear for us, for me and my colleagues here at USP, that this initiative helps to create references, helps to create models, helps to create some goals for all of the, for whole system. So everyone all of the institutions, all of the research groups will get benefits. This is very difficult, and Carlotti was very clear to, to tell us, it's very difficult to explain to our colleagues. But maybe, and I'm sure that we are getting the results more properly, but the result is you prove that if, let's just say, one of the indexes in in a university, and an excellent university has increased, the same index has increased in all other universities, not supported by this initiative. So this, I think, is our major, uh, major, major uh, challenge to show that excellence is good for everyone. Okay, thank you very much, and I and I hope that in the future we will be able to have something similar here. Thank you. Yes, so now it's time for questions. I think that we can open the floor and please.
and all of them agree that it's important to to give financial support for big groups doing interesting research and, and, and expensive research. Uh, but now is my personal opinion on diversity in sciences is crucial. If we take, for instance, physics, right? Einstein was the person who gave the greatest contribution to physics in the last 200 years, probably. And he was doing a research by himself. Could not be classified in any way as a group research. Could not fit in any big group. So it's important that we, and I say maybe German and also Brazil, do not forget that we, we, we must have money for excellence groups or etc. but we, do, we, we cannot forget these individuals who do the research by themselves. Yeah, thank you very much for that um, very good um, comment. It reflects in that indeed um, to me also recognized by DFG. Um, we have not cut our other research programs in order to finance the excellence initiative, but all the other research programs providing individual grants, inviting and providing fellowships, providing smaller research units, uh, providing just support for travel and whatever may be needed, um, are going on very strongly and have also been increased continuously over the last years. Um, so yes, the opportunities for the individual researcher are very, very important and we try to foster that diversity. And also within the big projects, um, the big projects have a lot of flexibility within the funding. They are not um, obliged to follow uh, the plans which have been laid down several years ago, but um, they can go into new directions which become important. So um, there is more diversity within such a project than one might imagine from the outside. Let me just uh, make a comment. But I mean, I'm not saying the funding agencies are wrong in this direction, but the, even the universities, no, sometimes they focus on these big projects. And, and, and that's a question. Maybe I talked to three German scientists. Three of them said the same. Diversity of, of areas of science in Germany is going down. Do you have any, any maybe it's a, it's a particular opinion, only three people. Do, do you have any measurement of that? Or, or because it, maybe it is an undesirable outcome of, of, of the universities focusing on the big projects. Um, indeed, there is a danger of um, uh, university leadership uh, focusing only on the big projects. That, for example, is the reason why we publish information on all projects, also the small projects um, online at any time. The university leadership gets uh, overviews of all the individual grants and the sum of individual grants at any university in Germany is more than what is coming through the coordinated programs and it's very important to highlight this. Um, for example, when a university um, presents um, its um, success, yes, there is uh, a tendency to highlight only the big projects, but what we observe, for example, now is that universities also tend to include grants um, which come from the European Research Council and these are individual grants but they are very prestigious individual grants and um, they are also very important. So yes, we see both tendencies um, and we are um, not too happy if the focus is only on, on this big corner. We try to de also develop our funding, our other funding programs such that they can adapt to what is needed in the future. Perhaps just another comment here. Of course, you have to think of the whole system of funding in Germany in this case. The Excellence Initiative is, as Dr. Berberger just ma mentioned in his talk, 15% of the DFG funding, but there are also other funding agencies who fu which fund in Germany. And yes, the Excellence Initiative gives strong incentives for large-scale research of larger groups. And of course, uh, this changes the landscape somehow. And what I call um, these um, imbalances within the system or these challenges for the university management. This is true, but to understand 
you have to understand that the Excellence Initiative was made to help the universities in to profile, to strengthen their strengths in order to be competitive on an international level. And this means, of course, priority setting, and of course, there's the danger of losing diversity of, of research. This has to be really carefully balanced. But the Excellence Initiative is not the program to balance that, but to push the very strong ones. And of course, there have to be mechanisms in order to balance that. And I totally agree that. I made this question in private, but I would like to do it public also. Uh, what was the impact of this program in the university and laboratories that don't participate of this initiative in Germany? And the second question, what is the percentage of the budget of this program uh, if you compare with the total budget of, the, of a German university? Total budget of the German in, in the German university system is roughly fifteen thousand million, um, fifteen billion euros, and the excellence initiative is roughly five hundred million. So it is a couple of percent um, ratio between the excellence initiative funding and the total funding going to the German university system. Um, now about the impact on um, universities not funded. Um, we see that also the universities which were not funded have um, looked at their strategies, have developed plans. And even those who submitted plans and did not get funding um, um, looked at the response they got. We provided full um, information on the evaluation results with all the details. And they looked at that and then they decided how to proceed. And um, certainly they have not been able to realize all their um, aims, but very often we observe that with support from the state um, and uh, with an other funding program, they have been able to realize uh, the most important parts of their plan. So in that sense, yes, the Excellence Initiative gives direct support to only some, but um, it really raises the overall quality of research. Here. Um, so I'm Paolo Nossespike from the Physics Institute. Um, I'd like to make a few comments and then ask a question. I think one of the major points is that this plan was a plan to redesign, reshape the landscape of research of the universities in Germany. Um, your country has a relatively different situation from ours in the way the universities work. There's central planning, central hiring, which is not the way it works here. Each university here hires um, with individual processes, different processes, their own faculty. And so from what you showed, I see there was a, a big change and increase in hiring and also hiring from other countries that you didn't have before and the tenure track and everything, you changed a lot. Um, I think that we cannot directly apply your initiatives in Brazil because the way the universities are different, you know, are ind independent from each other. However, I would like for this plan to, to draw on the, on the idea of reshaping the landscape. And I think we are deeply in need of that here in this country. Um, I, I see part of this initiative as the result of a crisis. Um, our funding level for research is at an unprecedented low in this country. Um, and, and the fact that if the money goes into the federal government, there are restrictions that apply that make spending the money very different, difficult. So I, I, I'm, I was uh, here also when, the, when this proposal was presented and uh, I'm, I, I think it's really important. It's uh, creative, it's thinking out of the box. If we want to change the landscape, 
um, we need substantial changes. And one of the changes that I think is a challenge for our future president, changing governance mechanisms in the university with the current governance mechanisms, uh, we're doomed, basically. Um, I would like to, to also comment um, that so making such big changes requires thinking out of outside of the box, requires being bold, but also I think the idea of doing this through excellence initiatives is you have to build on your strengths. And an excellence initiative is precisely a way of recognizing our strengths and where we should inject money to set the good examples. Um, a even though a lot of this will be done through collaborative networks, the role of the individual researchers, I think, is never lost in these, um, in, in these networks. Um, so finally, uh, the question would be, based on your experience on the ch changes in governance that were made in Germany, would you have suggestions for us, points that we should really focus on if we want to change the governance in our universities? Where, would, where should we start? Um, let me first uh, comment on your first comment about the hiring. Maybe this is a misunderstanding. In, in Germany, it's the universities are independent in their hiring uh, policy and the individual departments um, hire the professors with the consent of the leadership and within the strategic plan of the university. Um, now, do we have, um, maybe we have some impressions from our short visit uh, about the, the research um, landscape and the funding situation in Brazil, but um, it would be um, overestimating uh, the depth of our um, impressions to um, um, give advice on um, how you should adapt your excellence initiative to the situation in Brazil. I've learned quite a few differences, and certainly one thing I think is, is really important and which you are addressing is internationalization. Um, we are happy to have many international students in Germany. It's not so easy because of the language barrier, but um, teaching at universities is becoming more and more international and uh, many courses are given in English, certainly at the um, graduate and postgraduate level. Um, it's typical for uh, um, researchers in Germany to spend some time abroad in their career uh, early on and, and in, in different phases again and again. And um, this maybe is something which could also uh, really um, um, be an important element of um, your initiative. Thank you for the presentations. Uh, I also believe very much in the network system that will aggregate immersion people in the references group. I, I very much believe that uh, we can recognize talents uh, having networks. And networks, I think, is a key piece of uh, the reference money in one uh, specific clusters. cluster. Yes, it is. My my question is a little bit more political. In terms of perspective, uh, how do you, uh, uh, what's your, what's the German vision and the long term? You're gonna sustain this type of program forever? Or, and uh, this is, uh, this is important for us, our consistency in supporting uh, different uh, activities is not the same type of German system, okay? Yeah, um, that, that's uh, certainly a, a major <coughs> difference we also observe. And um, we are really happy to have um, had stability in our funding situation for the last 20 years at least. We have had steady increases in, uh, uh, of the investment by the government in research and development, <coughs> something like 3%, 5% each year. We had five-year um, planning periods where the government guaranteed, yes, for the next five years we will get 3% or 5% of increase each year. And then uh, in 2005 we had that additional excellence initiative which came on top. Um, 
Then we had um, the introduction of overhead, um, which was um, coming together with the excellence initiative and was one of the um, uh, elements which then um, that entered into all our funding programs with additional funding, not out of the um, previous budget. And uh, we observed that uh, stability is a very important element. If you want to attract high level researchers um, and to keep them in research, you need to offer them a perspective both on an institutional level and on an individual level. Okay, may I, another question for Catherine? Yes, of course. Okay, thank you, uh, Catherine. Uh, uh, in terms of goals, how pleased you are with uh, the, the FDG in Sao Paulo and what else could we do together to help the FG to help <laughs> us and to help both of sides? Yeah, um, I think as I said before, what our, our I mean, are, we are very satisfied with our collaboration with CAPES. We are very satisfied that we have this event today together with you. And I think this would be having more events of not really this kind, but on, on maybe scientific workshops, any promoting um, uh, measures for, for, for promoting our initiatives, which we can offer together with CAPES for joint collaboration, would be very helpful. And I think we could, um, on the basis of the fa fact that um, the state of Sao Paulo um, is the strongest uh, state in research, and not only in economy, but also in research, and has still quite some, some funding uh, potential, I think we could do much better in the state of Sao Paulo um, um, for promoting research projects between Germans and um, um, people from the state, uh, scientists from the state of Sao Paulo, scientists from USP. I think this would be very helpful <coughs> if we f could find also on the basis of our collaboration together with you at USP, if we could find um, instruments for advice, um, advertising more and more and also for figuring out maybe new new um, collaborative initiatives, activities in order to to seed um, collaboration and to have more of those um, projects such as the International Research Training Group. I think this would be very, very, very nice when this kind of instrument is a very sustainable instrument for international collaboration as well. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, uh, I would like to ask, uh, how, how do you treat the dir direction of the excellence program in Germany? Do you build on excellence that is already existence or you have mechanisms to, to, to build new excellence? Like uh, for, not, not only for young people, but for new areas. Do, do you aim uh, certain areas for the country uh, uh, as a strategy, a political strategy, as Professor Raoul said. Um, yes, thank you for that question. We don't within the Excellence Initiative. This is open to all areas of science and it's just a matter of academic excellence. Of course, there are other programs like um, from directly supported by the ministry which are targeted on specific technologies and which have specific aims but not in this segment of funding. Um, also, I would like to mention that, um, yes, uh, the clusters of excellence, for example, they build on existing strength, and in most places where we are now funding a cluster of excellence, we are also funding some smaller centers like the collaborative research centers, we have research training groups and so on um, in the same or in neighboring fields and together they build the strength of research um, in this field at this university. Uh, just a clarification, the, the Fraunhofer and the Max Planck Institutes are also included, it's not only universities. Yes, they cannot the apply statement. for funding directly, um, only universities can apply, but universities can then um, 
give part of the funding to Max Planck, Fraunhofer, and other institutes um, in exchange for a contribution to the common research program. But the, Ma the Max Planck and the Fraunhofer cannot apply themselves. They cannot has apply to be themselves. The yes, this is a program to strengthen the universities. Thank you. So, uh, thank you very much for this uh, excellent discussion and presentations. I have a question to Dr. Oliver Weiner. When you mention, I'm here, I'm Professor Mauricio Batista from International Office. When you mention uh, the, the governance of the clusters could be dictatorship or democracy, <laughs> I, I'm curious uh, whether which one have been chosen and if this has any relation with the success of the cluster. No, this has not been a, a criterion, but um, well, they have been chosen due to the innovation and due to their uh, scientific impact as, has, as it has been evaluated by the international revenues. And the clusters had to find their own structures with respect to the specific situation where they are. And the situation in the life science department, for example, or in the medicine is completely different from the situation in a humanities or social science department. So the, the way of dealing with these types of questions is strongly correlated with the people being involved. They have to find their way. And I think one of the strengths of the program is, is that we do not define any prerequisites for that. But it should be effective, it should be productive in terms of science and output and research in providing the best condition for that specific situation. And of course we observe that some of those clusters starting as basic democratic um, things somehow turned out to be more centralized with a strong um, speaker and a strong, well, somehow um, editorial or some uh, board really govern the structures, but what they always did, they had um, an advisory board from experts from abroad who helped them in doing these types of decision in order to legitimate what they actually did in order to discuss that. And so one of the major things is really try to integrate the major players and make it plausible what they're doing. I think this is can be done, but there's no um, single answer. Yeah, maybe I just add, yes, there is no um, recipe for success, but it's quite clear a cluster of excellence is not a one-man show. So, but also it's not um, a democratic um, uh, body. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the presentation. I'm Marilia Zeelenda, and uh, I'd like to ask you, it's a bit adding to this last question. So you say that you do not demand reports, but uh, that you would visit uh, these clusters. So would you, uh, well, would you expect to be the level, the degree of um, interference? Uh, would you really apply some concepts or demand certain conducts from, from the clusters? Uh, when would you interfere with something that you perhaps do not agree with? Um, we would not interfere, we would encourage, um, we would um, give um, advice if we are asked, um, but it's, these projects have been um, selected in a very tough competition and they know what they are doing. So they typically, they don't really need much um, guidance from us. We can give them examples how others deal with certain problems and then they can think about it. Um, they all have their advisory boards, as my colleague mentioned. So um, it's really such that uh, we from the funding agency um, have um, to do not uh, have much interference on, their, uh, on the way they proceed. But after five years, then there is a, a full evaluation of the results. Um, and that again is organized by us, but the evaluation is done by scientists, uh, colleagues peer-reviewed. 
Perhaps the only thing there, of course, there are some rules how they were allowed to spend the money, and of course we take care that these rules were taken into account, but this I think is, well, quite easily understandable. Okay, just before passing to the microphone to Professor Carlozzi, just a very quick last question. Um, you mentioned interdisciplinarity that is behind all, uh, all this um, excellence. And I would like to know if you have any strategies or what kind of implementation you do to transdisciplinarity, let's say in order to re schedule this landscape of research and then because I saw in your charts how well you are trying to counterbalance social sciences with uh, science, uh, hard sciences and so on. So is there any systemic way of transdisciplinarity in order to create this network? So we strongly believe that interdisciplinarity and multidisciplinarity is not a value as such, but research, good performance of research is the value. So we do not explicitly foster interdisciplinarity, but we say dream of what you want to do, have your plans, do what you need in order to reach new goals in science. And so what we saw is that this um, initiative fostered really cooperation between working groups which were next to each other and never talked to each other. And suddenly there was an incentive and there was the money to try things you never dare to do so far because you do not really explicitly have to, to apply for that, but you have only the, the overall gain. So this is perhaps important to understand. These clusters, they received free money for their basic idea and they were free to distribute them distribute this money according to their needs and they have something what we call seed funding. So they just have free money to play around and do things they never do and to, to foster cooperation and co communication between each other and this helps a lot and so we s see that the majority of these projects are not even one from one large area but they always bridge two or even three areas so from life science to engineering science to social science or from computer science integrating material science so most the majority of those projects are very very interdisciplinary but not because we expect them to be interdisciplinary but to we expect them to be good thank you thank you very much so professor Carlotti, i think um, it's good to to wrap up Thank you, Laura. I would like to, to close this event. And the, the idea of this workshop was to better know the, the German uh, initiative uh, and help us to, bu to build our own strategy to, to have better science in Brazil. And I, I would like to point out two, two aspects for USP. Uh, the first one is the role of USP in this process. I think we have, we should support strongly CAPS, not only to have more money from the, the federal government or for the, the funders to USP, but to change the, the scenario, to, to change the landscape of research in Brazil. Uh, for example, change our framework, legal framework, to change our governance of our universities. So we have many positive aspects that I see, not only the money, but the, the whole uh, change that we can have in, in this process. Is the second, second point is the, the ongoing call of CAPES. I would like to, to send to CAPES in April the best plan of internationalization in Brazil. So, I hope that all of you can help us uh, to have a good plan to send it to, to our next uh, president and then to send it to CAPES in April. So thank you very much. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Professor Raul. Thank you, Catherine, for all your help in, for organizing this event. Thank you very much. <laughs> Laura, I just want to stress my Thanks, many thanks for you for coming here to 
to give these presentations, and I'm sure that they were very important for us to better understand the German initiative, to better solve our questions, and I'm sure that this will help us to avoid misunderstanding, even prejudice with this type of initiatives. Thank you very much indeed.